I'm Dr. John Byron, professor of New Testament at Ashland Theological Seminary, and with us today is Noah Schumacher. Noah is a graduate of Ashland Theological Seminary, and he is the pastor of the High Mill Church of Resurrection in Canton, Ohio. Noah, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. Excited Great. to be here. Now, how long have you been at High Mill Church of the Resurrection? We've been at High Mill Church since 2011, um, but I took on the lead pastor role in the fall of 2014. Okay, and you've been there for a while before that then? Yeah, been there for a while. Okay, you yeah. grew up in that church, didn't you? I did. I'm the son of a preacher, okay. and uh, my father started the church, and my wife and I had plans to possibly go overseas and do different uh, you know, mission work, but God called us to Canton, Ohio, where we minister now. All right, so you're pretty much ministering in the area and even the church that yeah. you grew up in. Yeah, born and raised. All Christ. right, excellent. And so your father is still active in the ministry? Or? He is. He's on staff and, uh, you know, we joke and say he's retired, but he still does a lot, which okay. is great. So I'm honored to have uh, my dad still there next to me as a valued member of the team who's doing a lot of good. All right. Yeah. Now, recently you had an opportunity um, to make a difference in somebody else's yeah. life. Uh, that somehow you also found God's call on you in your ministry. This you want to explain a little bit about that? You know, a while back in September, we found out that my mom was battling liver disease, and I couldn't sit back and watch my mom pass away. I had to do something, and so Michelle uh, did some research, and we we found That's out. That's your wife, correct? My wife, sorry, yes. yeah. Michelle's my wife, and we have three amazing children, and uh, we've been married 13 years. Uh, she's really the hero in the story that you're about to hear. But she and I did some research and found out that we could do a live liver donation surgery mm -hmm. to save my mom's life. And immediately, you know, as her son, I knew, how, you know, how could I not do this? And so we called Cleveland Clinic, and we went through... A series of testing and uh, blood work, imaging results, looking at my liver to see if I'm compatible. We did this for three straight days, and it was intense. And we we left Cleveland Clinic thinking and knowing with confidence that okay, this is going to work out. All of our doctors, the whole medical team, you know, they were so positive. But they said the only thing we have to wait for is the imaging results on your liver to see if you'll be able to uh, officially do it. Mm -hmm. And so I got a call a week and a half after the, the time of testing at Cleveland Clinic. And I was in my office and my coordinator uh, called me and I answered the phone and I could tell in her voice there was something was, was off. Hmm. And she said, you know, no, I'm sorry. It's not going to work. Wow. Immediately, you know, I dropped the phone. I'll never forget that moment. And I just, I wept. I, I cried uncontrollably uh, for probably about 20 seconds. And she was on the other line of the phone and I picked it back up and I just said, why? what happened and the proportion that my mom needs of a liver versus the size and the the shape of my liver it would have left me with a short time to live i would have died um, she could have got the liver but i would have most likely died and the the love part in me uh you know tried to challenge her and the team saying please can we can we take a risk can we see if we can do this for right. her still and obviously they weren't gonna let me go through with that because they knew it would be fatal. And so I had to accept that I couldn't do it for my mother. But at the end of the phone call, she said something that changed everything for Michelle and I. She said, I understand you can't do this for your mother. However, there's a child who is dying in our, or very sick, who's in our Cleveland Clinic Children's Unit. And if you feel led, you can continue on to save the life of this child. This was like not even on the radar. Hmm. I mean, this was a curveball right. that I didn't see coming. It was always only ever about my, my mother. And so I knew immediately, of course I will do this for a child. You know, that's somebody's son, that's somebody's daughter, you know, somebody's grandson or granddaughter. And I said with wisdom, I need to call my wife first. <laughs> so always I called- Always a good idea. Yeah, I know. So I called Michelle and you know, she just blew me away. Uh, I told her the whole scenario. She was sad, shocked. Uh, but then I told her about the child. And I said, what do you think? And her response was just amazing. And one of the biggest reasons why I just love this one more than anybody else. She said, you know, of course we can do this. This is living out the gospel of Jesus. Right. And I said, I, I could not agree more. 
And we, we both took a collective, you know, oh, okay, here we go, because life was about to change very quickly for us. Right. And so we agreed, we called, we went back and did some more testing and scheduled surgery. And we were able to do it on January 30th and save the life of the child. And um, my mom ended up getting her liver a week and a half ago. All right. uh, so the whole, the whole story has kind of come full circle. Um, but it's been quite the journey, the last three months in recovery and then a month back now in ministry full time. Now, luckily, or bless, blessings to everybody who right. received their liver and are healing well. Um, but clearly there was some aspect of your faith. You've kind of hinted at that. But yeah. how did your faith play into this desire to provide such a sacrifice for somebody else? Because it's understandable for your mom. Yeah. But this is a stranger. Yeah, for me, it, it was kind of a shock when, when anybody would say anything to Michelle and I, like, how could you do this? Or why are you doing this? Because for us, it was never, it was never a question because we're Christians. I understand people who are not Christian would do this as well. Right. But for us, our faith played such a role that, you know, to say I follow Jesus, it means literally, I follow Jesus. And that, you know, in, in that phrase, being a follower of Christ, entails with it sacrifice, inconvenience, pain, trial, even suffering, and even death for many people around the world. And so for us, it was a, a no-brainer. We like to live by the phrase of, you know, love big or go home. Um, I was the son of, you know, my father and mother who were Jesus freaks from the 70s. They took in mm. people off the streets. I, I married a, a woman who carries that same DNA more so than myself. And so our faith in Christ and our commitment to follow Jesus made this one of the e easiest decisions um, we could ever make. But now it's not just you and Michelle and your family that got impacted by this. You're right. a pastor of a church. I imagine you had to take a few weeks off to recover. There was a lot of medical tests. Yeah. How has this decision impacted your church and just your ministry? You know, being away for three months in recovery which was always interesting because people thought, oh, you have three months away. This must be so nice for you to rest vacation, and right? relax. Yeah. yeah. Uh, no, you can ask you know, my wife. And the reason I said she's a real hero is because she had to take care of me for all that time. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't easy. And so being away for three months you know, had positive impact on the community faith that we lead, but also negative impact as well. Uh, positive because you know, it brought inspiration to a lot of people that we lead that we weren't doing it for that purpose, but a byproduct was, you know, wow, as a pastor, as leaders, you really are taking this seriously. And that has instilled a sense of confidence and commitment in being able to follow our lead as we try to best follow Jesus. Uh, the negative component is, you know, when you're away for three months and uh, there's a lot of shifting and changing, it can be challenging for a church. And so we are still in that ripple effect of that decision of where we're trying to bring, you know, um, that sense of stability again. Because when, you know, when the shepherd's away, things can happen and, right. and it, challenges can arise and, and that's taken place. But, you know, God is faithful and he is instilling within our own church a new ethos and culture that really resembles even, you know, the sacrifice that, that we did. Right. Being a church that truly loves and follows Jesus and you know we say we want to be a church that Jesus would attend yeah. and that's kind of what we're aiming for so there's been a lot of impact okay now yeah. a lot of people today talk about the importance of social justice and I think you and I both agree yeah. that the church in many ways is recovering uh, that yeah. part of its DNA the importance of helping uh, those who are in need of mercy, the, you know, those in poverty. Mm -hmm. Yet, um, at times it seems like there is a lack of a good theological anchor accompanying yeah. that social justice. Um, how is your theological training in general and just your own uh, ministry philosophy yeah. uh, been foundational, not just prior to this, but during this time? You know, going through Ashland Seminary helped me understand that there is no divide you know, between good works and faith, orthopraxy and orthodoxy. There's, there's to be no divide. If we say we follow Christ, then we live Christ. Uh, and so my theological training helped anchor me in a firm sense of if we say that we're Christian, then we do. Not that we sit back and say we are something. We, we embody something, a truth. 
And so when I hear that, you know, that uh, debate go back and forth, which is often politicized you know, from both sides of the aisle, it always strikes me as odd because to be Christian is to embody social justice. It is to have right. belief in core doctrine. And so my theological training here at Ashland has made that the most common sense approach to my faith. And so when I hear that debate going on and on, I, I have a hard time relating because to me, I think it reflects, um, and I say this lovingly, but it, it reflects a general ignorance of understanding Christianity itself. Right. Because Christianity itself is anchored in action to people in margins who are in need, who need hope and truth. And yeah, Ashlyn helped me uh, develop that foundation in ways I could never even imagine. All right. Well, you're a bit unusual in your ministry calling in that you grew up in the church. Yeah. Um, you sort of uh, inherited, for yeah. lack of a spiritual word, your position there from your father. So you really didn't need to go to seminary. Right. Uh, yet you chose to go to seminary. You, you, you finished through the degree while pastoring. Yeah. Um, what would you say to somebody who told you or even asked you, why would I need to even go to seminary? What's it going to do for me in my ministry that I can't do right here in my own context? Wow, where do I begin with that? <laughs> you know, I think the first thing that you have to think about is when you go through seminary, what you are doing is learning how to submit. You're learning how to live a life of humility because you are allowing yourself to be molded and shaped even down to a syllabus, down to texts that you read, uh, lectures that you sit through to learn from, you're learning the disciplines of following mm -hmm. Jesus in seminary that equip you to be a better leader and pastor. Because what people look for in a church is they're looking for leadership that knows how to walk humbly in being obedient to the gospel of Jesus. I can think of no better environment that teaches you humility, that teaches you how to submit to the, the training of the Lord than seminary hands down. And so people who think that they don't need that because, you know, all they have is, or all they need is the spirit, which I've heard that phrase over and over, or, you know, they have many books, so they don't need a teacher. Uh, I always feel sad for those kinds of individuals because it reflects uh, a large ego that I believe the Lord longs to see replaced with, with his humility and his spirit that seminary really instills. And so you'd be missing out and your people that you lead would be missing out greatly yeah, right. um, by bypassing that. Reminds me of uh, one of my uh, mentors who, when he told me it was time for me to go on for my PhD and I wasn't sure I wanted to or needed to. Yeah. And the reason he encouraged me was not because you would get the letters under your, after your name. He said, you owe it to your students to get the yes. best training possible. Yeah. And that's why I did it and that's why you came to seminary. Yes. Were there maybe one or two, uh, I'm, I'm sure your whole seminary experience was nothing but, yeah, right? Yeah, <laughs> it, it was like Pilgrim's Progress, right? Yeah. Of course, not, that's not always such a positive yeah, metaphor either. I was either. just going to say that. But is there, uh, were there one or two impactful experiences that when you think back to your time here at Ashland Seminary that they just continue to uh, reverberate through your mm -hmm. life? Yeah, you know, the first one that comes to mind would be, I think it was a year two or year three, but going through cohort with a group of students that reflected such theological diversity. Hmm. Uh, we all had to check our, our theological baggage at the door, hmm. so to say, right. and we had to submit to a process for, at that time it was quarters, but it was, I think it was two or three quarters where we went through together, learning uh, at a table together, and you know, there would be times of debating and times of arguing, times of, you know, praying for one another. That experience has nurtured an appreciation for diversity in the body of Christ that I would never have had, hmm. especially being non-denominational, being an evangelical stream. Now it has helped me see uh, the importance of partnering with, you know, my mainline denominational brothers and sisters uh, and many others. And so that little experience brought friendships that I have for the rest of my life that I still connect with to this day, but really helped me see the body of Christ at large. So that's one. Can I list another one? Yeah. Is that okay? Yeah. All right. Another one that comes to mind, which is a little unique, was I took one elective course here at Ashland 
in, it might have been 2012 or 2013, and it was with a man named Tom Snyder. And Tom Snyder led me through monastic spirituality. It was such a unique offering when I, I saw it. this, yeah. And when I saw it, I was like, oh my gosh, this is, you know, I've never been exposed to anything like this. And so he led me through for a whole quarter understanding the, the tenets of Benedictine spirituality, looking at the, the desert monks, the desert fathers, and, and looking at medieval monasticism and all these areas of the faith that I never would have been exposed to had I not been here at Ashland. And during that time, he had me read, I mean, all kinds of books, and I read everything. I learned about praying the hours during this time. I learned about um, you know, Benedictine practices of hospitality, st simplicity, stability, all those things still form the spirituality that I live with to this day, all these years later. And that one quarter, or however long it was, that elective shaped me in a way that I, I will never be able to um, convey how much that class meant to me. And if you were to allow me to keep going, I could share classes you know, with yourself, classes with Dr. Hawk and Dr. Silva and many others who, because of the faculty's mindset of pouring into students Every class for me, because I submitted to the process, was transformational. Yeah, I always find it amazing when I ask a student um, what was one of their best experiences, and it's those unexpected courses or moments in the classroom uh, where God connects with them, yeah. not necessarily during chapel, but maybe in a reading, a point in a yes. lecture, and um, suddenly things just come together for them in a way they didn't expect. Yeah. That was my story over and over. What would you tell somebody who is thinking about seminary but they're not sure, maybe one or two pieces of advice? Oh, wow. Um, first, I would say do it. I mean, I think I've said this since day one from graduation that seminary has always been uh, the one thing in my life that has transformed my faith in the best way possible. Mm -hmm. So I would say do it. But when going into this environment, the advice I would give would actually be um, twofold. The first I kind of alluded to already would be humility. To understand that you're walking into an environment that you need to learn how to submit. You need to learn how to trust professors, trust uh, cohort leaders and, and, and fellow students. Because uh, we don't have all the answers. When I first came into seminary, I thought I did. And that I realized quickly, you know, I had a lot of arrogance and ego within me and the Holy Spirit helped me keep that at check. And so humility is key. Secondly, I would say responsibility. There's this expectation when we come to seminary for many people that we will just you know, walk on the clouds of heaven because we're in this environment and everything is perfect <laughs> and we will be so close to Jesus. And that's, uh, that's not the responsibility of faculty here. As seminary students, we come in with personal responsibility to maintain our devotional lives to such a place where when we come in to engage texts and topics where intellectual wrestling matches are taking place and theological inquiry, we are bringing the very presence of God with us because we are taking responsibility for our growth in Christ. Right. That's not on yourself or any other professor. And so when we can have that mindset, I believe with that humility and that responsibility, it comes together in a beautiful way where our student experience here at Ashland can be so enriched because God is with us in the journey and we're submitting in the process. And um, I think when you come out the end at graduation, you look back and it's not letters after your name that you're proud of, it's the person that you've become because of those two things, in my opinion, humility and responsibility. That's the advice I would give. All right. Yeah, it just strikes me. One of the things I always tell students when they ask me, what is Ashland like? And I yeah. say, it's a place where we have freedom of thought and yeah. expression with a common commitment to God. Yeah, so. I couldn't agree more. Well, uh, just as we get ready to close today, yeah. what does the future hold for you? You're <laughs> recovering now, Yeah. Um, getting back to your old self. Uh, yeah. What are your hopes, dreams, and maybe even expectations, if not fears, for the future now that you've gone through this experience? There's no fears per se. Uh, there's more or less a uh, excitement because I think through this process for Michelle and I, we have learned that to follow Jesus will always instill some sense of discomfort. You know, for me, it's been physical pain through the whole journey. 
But when I was away, God really helped me see that coming out of this season and into ministry again mm -hmm. after three months of recovery, it's not business as usual. That God really is, for at least in our ministry, He's building a new culture of the kind of church that takes such seriousness and a literal reading of the life of Jesus that we're you know, positioning ourselves to be that for our city, for our community, and we pray that we will be able to expand in other places as well. And so we have a lot of dreams, a lot of hopes, but we're still catching our breath. And so it's hard to balance those, you know, the big visionary type things right. that God's speaking to us. Um, and so we're trying to live in the moment. And the moment right now is we're really proud, we're really thankful, and uh, we're excited that what God has done through this journey. And you know, I forgot to say this earlier, but we also remember the family that lost a loved one who donated to my mom. And that family and that individual is also a hero that deserves to be mentioned. And we don't know that person. We might not ever. Uh, but that's another part of the story that we're trying to really reflect on right now in the season two. All right. Yeah. Well, I can tell you that all of us here at Ashland Seminary are proud of you. Um, we look up to you. I'm not sure I could make the decision that you did. Um, but we're glad that you uh, have done that. And yeah. uh, we're glad that you're a part of our family. Oh, yeah. And so we thank you for joining us today, and thank we look you. forward to hearing what God is doing in your life in the near future. Thank you, Dr. Byron. All right. Thank you, everybody, for joining us.